Hey guys, Phil Baumhardt here. So for today's video, I'll be making a CX out of a leaf spring. This is something I, uh, this is an abandoned trailer I found in the woods. So I went out there with a hacksaw and uh, sawed this off of the uh, suspension system. So uh, that was actually quite a job just with a little old uh, hacksaw. But uh, I've got a second one of these. So I'm sure many of you already know already, but the uh, CX or SAX or Scramasax is uh, a single-edged fighting knife used by the Vikings, Anglo-Saxons, Franks, uh, just sort of the northern Germanic peoples. They all kind of had their own variations and styles. Uh, I'm not going to delve into that on this video, maybe a, another time. So this is going to be modeled uh, roughly off of the Beagnoth sax, which um, is in the uh, Museum of London, I believe. So it's going to be a longer type blade. Uh, the customer is looking for a 16 to 18 inch blade and kind of the uh, the broke back uh, Warncliffe uh, design. First thing I'm going to do is break apart this whole uh, bundle and I got an angle grinder now to do that. Okay, so here's the uh, angle grinder for those of you who didn't see my uh, Indian War Club video. That was kind of a debut video for this tool, but just a four and a half inch uh, DeWalt made in the USA. So far it's been working out real good for me. So. With this, uh, this spring here, we got these two little clips here, so I'll just saw those down. This one is already uh, popped, and there's a nut in the middle, and uh, we'll just uh, cut through all that. I'm going to try to cut in from the side, so that way I don't put a big old gouge in the, uh, the face of that there. I don't think, uh, don't think it'll really be a big deal either way, because all this is going to get forged down no matter what I do. So. Alright, so the spring is sprung. Alright, let's see what we got to work with here. Uh, nice. Okay, so we got some uh, good long pieces. A lot of rust and corrosion in here over the years. But, uh, you know, at max, the blade only needs to be about 18 inches. So, like out of this one right here, it's about 21 and a half inches. Something like this one would actually work out pretty good because I can take take this, make a tang. I'll cut it off at an angle here for that uh, sack shape. I'm gonna try just using the uh, angle grinder instead of trying to get it in the forge for this first uh, for this first go. Okay, so we're almost through there. You can see the line on the other side appearing. I think the blade is getting dull, and um, so rather than change out a blade, start dulling that up, I'm just gonna get this hot, and I'm just gonna bend it uh, like I would uh, any other piece of steel that I'm cutting. Okay, so the plan for this is I'm going to just start, uh, I'll take about three inches here for the tang. That'll leave me with at least 16 inches for the blade and we'll be good to go. Okay, so you can see that I'm, so I'm holding it with the blade facing 
uh, up towards me and hammering uh, like this. So that way I get a sharper angle at the spine portion of the tang. And I've got a, a whole video uh, kind of talking about this, but basically if we look at the uh, knives from archaeology, you can see that's how they are formed, where it's more of a gradual uh, taper going from the blade to the tang, and it's a harder transition from the spine to the tang. And the way you do that is making sure that the spine is on the anvil because when you hit it, it's the anvil that's doing the compression, not the hammer, at least when it's hot. And this steel is pretty thin here at the end of the spring because it kind of tapers off, so I switched to a lighter hammer because you can see it kind of uh, bending off to the side when I would hit it. But we're, uh, I think we're in good shape. Okay, there's what the, the tang is looking like. Uh, pretty happy with that. This isn't going to be a, a tang that goes all the way through and is peened over. Uh, I probably could do that if I really wanted to, but uh, this is going to be just sort of uh, set into the uh, into the handle uh, with friction and some epoxy. But in any case, I'm going to leave the tang as is for now. So we'll move on to doing some edge bevels. So I'll hammer the edge bevels, kind of thin out that material. Uh, we'll get a little bit of a curve, right? Uh, but then I'll go back through and flatten it out, and uh, uh, I might even narrow this a little bit. It's like the big North Sax is only about uh, one and a half inches long. This is uh, a little over one and a half, so you know the tip is pretty much good to go. I'll, I'll kind of leave that alone. I might round off uh, that little corner there, but that's not anything I can't do on the grinder. But there's so many little pits and rust marks and stuff like that that I'll probably try to go over just about everything with the. Uh, the hammer just to uh, smooth everything out or at the very least just to make sure that I don't have any big uh, pit marks in my uh, edge bevel. Okay, most of the uh, corrosion is right in here. The, the front seems to be pretty good. I'm not so much worried about the spine, but you can see we got a pretty good uh, curve going now. So before that gets too extreme, I'm going to go through, flatten that out, and then we'll probably hit the edge bevels uh, a couple more times.
That was really supposed to be a normalizing heat, and I had that thing perfectly straight, but uh, when I checked it, just from being in the fire like that, probably got a little too hot because it, uh, you know, warped again. And I think that's just from it, uh, you know, sagging in the fire. So we'll get it hot again and uh, we'll get that normalized again. So the idea was normalizing is just to get it up to temperature and just let it cool down normally. Um, and that just sort of helps relieve any stress or anything weird that's, that's in there from the, the forging and, uh, you know, the original spring shape. And then after that, I'll put it back in and kneel it and let it just cool down uh, very slowly in the, uh, the charcoal ashes. Okay, so after uh, letting the blade anneal, I soaked it in uh, vinegar for part of the day here and I'm cleaning it up with a, uh, a uh, sanding drum. This is for like uh, removing paint from uh, cars and stuff like that. So this uh, does a good job of getting off all this fire scale and, uh, and gunk. Right now it looks like a uh, archaeological find, like I pulled it out of a bog. Okay, so you can see that it's still, uh, it's got a lot of pitting left over from the, uh, from the spring. It looks kind of cool, especially since the, uh, there's not so much on the, the edge side where I, you know, was hammering a little bit of a bevel in, which was intentional. That was the, the plan there. So uh, I think it looked kind of cool uh, with this being the edge, this kind of being pitted and, you know, a little more uh, ancient looking. There's the other side. So kind of cool. Okay, there we go. Now you can see right in here, where I forged this tanging, you can see all the where the metals kind of squished over and folded over and it leaves these kind of lines. Uh, you see that in archaeological finds from the uh, from the iron where you have higher and lower carbon contents, especially you know the uh, the lower carbon steel is eaten away over the years, thousand you know over a thousand years, and it leaves uh, you know high and low spots in the steel itself. But stuff like this just it's cool to me that it, you know, it kind of creates a uh, connection to history and a connection to the uh, original blacksmiths that I'm trying to emulate. That's part of why I like doing what I do. The way that I do it is that it, um, I'm, I try to make similar weapons to the ones that were made in antiquity and I try to make them in kind of a similar way. Of course, I'm using modern materials and modern tools in some instances just for the sake of time. But stuff like this just looks cool to me. Okay, so let's uh, get to grinding it. I'll start with a uh, an older belt just to get an initial grind in, and then we'll switch over to a clean one. This should be a fairly straightforward grind with this kind of blade pattern just going across a straight line. Don't need to worry about uh, you know any curve of the point. Uh, I kind of didn't do very much hammering at the uh, at the point then, so you can see it's still thicker there, which is good because the uh, the tip always seems to thin down um, a lot thinner than the rest of it. It's really easy to get this too thin and then you start losing material and then you can also risk uh, having it melt off and the quench or break off. So we'll uh, clean up our profile here and then we'll uh, just grind in some uh, primary edge bevels. Okay, so now to uh, shape up the tip, I'm going to try to uh, bring the spine portion down to the where the edge is going to be. Because right now I left it uh, pretty square, which is what I want because uh, you can see it got pretty thin down on the rest of the edge. Uh, it's still thicker up here. Uh, but if I start taking material 
and bringing it this way we're going to get more of a curve so to keep this edge straight we're going to bring the spine down to the point i'll probably do a little bit of cleanup in here because i got a little bit of a dip so we'll uh we'll take that out well that should be all there is to it Okay, well I'm happy with the uh, the rough grind on this, so I'm gonna go ahead and start working on the handle here. So I got a nice piece of uh, ash wood here, and I've got the width of the uh, the tang up here marked on the wood. So I'll drill that out, and uh, we'll get this fit in there. So I got my quarter inch uh, long drill bit. I got a bit of tape on there to kind of stop it from going any further than where I want it. Uh, I could go all the way, but uh, somewhere right about there is where I need it to be. I don't want this tang to go all the way through because if we look at a lot of the historic examples they actually look just like this where it's just a tang and it just uh, stops so uh, this will be mainly friction fit and epoxy holding this bad boy together but uh, I'm trying to make this kind of as uh, historically accurate as possible so I think uh, we're doing good so far so let's uh, drill this out and see what we can get. Basically, I you know drilled my holes however width I want them, and then I uh, just sort of expand those holes and walk them out until I make them into basically one uh, big hole or one uh, slit. Okay, so I got the uh, the blade fully seated in the uh, the log here. So now we can start uh, cutting it down. We'll split it down and basically just take away everything that uh, doesn't look like a knife handle. So we've got a little bit of uh, curvature in the grain. Hopefully that won't give us too much trouble. But we'll see uh, see what happens. So there you have it. Okay, so this is a one risk of my uh, method is uh, we've got a blowout on the side here. Uh, so the drill wandered a little bit too far that way. And because of the way the, the grain of the wood wanted to take it, now we've got a giant uh, hole at the side of our handle. So uh, we got to start over. Okay, so we got a little bit neater uh, slot in there, so we'll see how well the uh, the blade fits. Okay, that's a pretty good fit. I uh, probably wanted a little bit deeper, but. Uh, 
Let's go back to the X. Okay, so we've kind of kind of squared up all the corners on this. That's what uh, that's what she's looking like. So we could probably start uh, sanding it on the uh, on the grinder. Be able to take off material in a more much more uh, controlled manner. Uh, I still like using the axe for some of it because uh, you get the strongest part of the wood. You know, you kind of let the grain stick together. I'm going to figure out which way I want to be facing which direction. I think we'll do this because uh, that'll keep the back fairly straight. So I'll do a little bit more with the axe. Then we'll take it on the grinder. Alrighty, it's starting to look like a handle. So let's take it over to the grinder and start uh, refining it in a bit. So that first quench, it had a good uh, warp to it, so I got it hot again, straightened it out, and then after the second quench, I uh, clamped it up in this uh, steel here. So I got this long piece and then a little bit shorter piece, but uh, I didn't sort of let it just finish cooling down in the vise like that, and uh, it's good and straight now. So happy with that, so we'll get it in the oven and uh, get it tempered. All right, well here's what it looks like after the uh the temper, did the triple temper in the oven at about 375. I can see the straw colors through the black of the uh, of the oil baked on there. Lost a little bit of the uh, tip and made it a little too pointy, so if that's too bad, uh, I'll just have to put it back in there. So I'm going to hit this with the wire wheel. Uh, I want to kind of leave this dark. Uh, I haven't soaked it in vinegar because uh, the vinegar could, can sometimes be uh, spotty as far as how much it takes off or how little. So, you know, a lot of times it doesn't take off uh, very much at all, and then sometimes it does a whole lot, so we'll just see what this does. Okay, so I didn't do a whole, whole lot, but you can see there's a little bit of a difference. You can see some of the bare metal shining through. I'm tempted to hit it with the that rougher wheel, but I don't want to leave any scratches. I think I'll try it down here by the tang and we'll see how it looks. You can see that just rips that scale right off of there, except for the uh, the deep spots. So, so that, uh, this one is a little bit worn out. I've been using it for quite a while. So, uh, when these things are brand new, they leave pretty deep uh, gouges and score marks. It's just something to be aware of. I think I'm going to try it.
Okay, so the blade's good and sharp, so now it's time to uh, get this thing glued up. Okay, so I also uh, took a grinder to the uh, the tang just to expose that metal. That should help uh, get it to stick on there better. So I got some uh, clear weld of the uh, JB weld epoxy, and it's a very liquidy uh, stuff. So I'm just going to squirt it down in there, and I'll be able to mix it up. And I taped up the blade because I expect this to kind of be a mess. But I want everything that's not a blade to be filled with epoxy. It's a little test fit with the blade. See how far that will go in there. See if anything squirts out. Use the tang to uh, kind of mix it up a bit too. What you don't want is for the uh, glue not to be mixed. So you can see as I squish it on in there, it all kind of is oozing out. So that means I definitely got enough in there. Here we go, let's seat this bad boy. Okay, I think that's good and on there, so we'll get the tape off, clean up all this excess glue, and we'll be good to go. Okay, so here's what the uh, handle's looking like. I uh, started putting the uh, linseed oil on it uh, without the camera rolling, I kind of forgot about that. So this is uh, yesterday and I put a couple of thin coats on here. Uh, no stain, just right over the, the raw wood, so I uh, sanded off the uh, all the epoxy that was on there, and I sanded it down to about uh, 4,000 grit sandpaper, so this is a really smooth handle. So this is, this is dried for at least 24 hours, and uh, I'm just gonna show you, when I say a thin coat of linseed, what I'm talking about. I've got my uh, pure raw linseed oil that I always use, and uh, you know, dip my finger in there, just enough to get it on my finger, and that's already uh, probably gonna be too much. So I'm just gonna dab it in a couple of spots, and I will use another finger to spread that around. So just the thinnest amount of oil to, uh, to get it on there. Because if you put too much it's going to stay sticky for a long time and eventually it will uh, polymerize, which is what it does when you put it on top of um, your standard wood stain. It kind of sits on the surface and doesn't really soak in and then it'll kind of uh, basically turns into a polymer, which isn't a bad thing, but you just want to be aware that that's what's, uh, what's happening. So there you go, just that one little finger dab. I got oil all over this. And I'm just gonna leave this in the sun. It's a nice sunny day. And we'll let the sun just sort of let it soak in and penetrate. And that'll give us a real nice, real nice finish. Okay, here's what the uh, finished knife is looking like. So this is a uh, leather sheath. It's got my uh, birch oil uh, finish on there. Came out really well. And uh, there's the, the blade for you. The linseed oil uh, finished right on there real nicely. The wood soaks it up uh, rather quickly, and it doesn't take much because it's already a pretty dark wood, so get a little oil on there and it just comes out looking uh, real nice. Uh, so overall, really happy with the way this knife came out. Got some real nice heft to it. This is a really good slasher and chopper, so I did a few cutting tests with it, nothing uh, too crazy. I had a um, cut through a honey rock melon and some uh, milk jugs just to, just to see how it would cut. I didn't want to try chopping through any logs. I don't want to uh, abuse this too much because it's a uh, custom order going out to uh, Raven Banner Creative. And he was looking for, uh, on the sheath, he wanted something that would hang uh, vertically off the belt so it would be easier to wear kind of like in a uh, uh, modern setting, you know, so if he's out walking in the woods, what have you, he can wear this. Uh, he didn't really want the uh, horizontal sheath system, so I, sew, uh, so I sewed on these uh, two belt loops. And this is modeled off of some Carolingian finds. Uh, as well as some sword 
scabbards from the uh, Vendel period in uh, Sweden. I actually got a chance to go to a museum and see some of those swords and I'm going to have a uh, separate video on that. Fits in there quite nicely. I did a little bit of wet molding uh, around the handle. So that slides in there real nice and that's locked in there good and solid so nice sheath and you can still kind of get a full grip on the handle. Um, sometimes I'll leave a finger out as I pull it out and I can uh, wrap it on the rest of the way uh, but you can also just grab the whole thing pull and it's ready to go. So. Yeah, this is definitely a formidable uh, fighting weapon. I can see why the uh, Vikings and Anglo-Saxons uh, like these. You still have a very fine stabbing point, but there's still, you know, the center of percussion is still up here, so it still has got a lot of forward weight and uh, chops and slashes really well. A lot of power to this, even in a short little blade like this, and this is like a 16-inch uh, blade. So, and with that uh, that spring, you can see it's got lots of uh, pitting and corrosion on there, and I just I think that adds to the uh, adds to the look of it. So hopefully uh, the customer likes this knife, and if you want uh, if you want me to make one of these as well, get a hold of me through uh, Facebook, Instagram, or through uh, Etsy, and we'll see what we can do for you. So this is a knife that uh, you know he wanted to be as historically accurate as possible. So uh, there's there's no so it's a narrow tang, um, no rivets, no guard, just a blade, and then the handle fitted on there. But I think it's a real handsome knife. And, uh, you know, with that kind of hand forged uh, feel, it's definitely got some better character to it than just taking a piece of uh, flat stock and, you know, cutting an angle off and then grinding it down. I think this looks a lot nicer than uh, something done all through uh, stock and rule. But you could definitely make a, a uh, you could definitely make a sax through uh, stock and rule. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, forging it out just uh, adds a little something and uh, seems to make it a little more historically accurate. So. All right, well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, be more Viking.